Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you are new to the channel, hello and welcome. And if you are returning, welcome back. Today, we are discussing more cases suggested by you all in our community. But first, this is your friendly reminder to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you know when I post. But with that being said, let's get into it. Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown was a good kid. He was a senior in high school, he played on the state football team, he was a talented actor in the drama club, and was also class president. And the strange circumstances surrounding his disappearance and eventual discovery of his death has remained shrouded in mystery with investigators unable to determine if he was murdered, had an accident, or committed suicide. Thomas had grown up in the small community of Canadian, Texas. He was described as sweet, dependable, and responsible. He was well-liked by both teachers and classmates. He lived with his mom and stepdad. His older brother, Tucker, was already in college, but was visiting for Thanksgiving weekend. The day before Thanksgiving, on November 23rd, 2016, had seemed normal. Around 6 p.m., Thomas went to meet up with some friends. They hung out for a few hours, just driving around, chatting, but eventually they all decided to head home around 11 p.m. Thomas had a midnight curfew and left himself plenty of time to get home. He was seen at 11.28 p.m. at Frank's Oil and Gas, and there was a charge on his debit card for gas. He was driving his red Dodge Durango and was seen one more time at 11.38 p.m. heading in the direction of his house. Thomas's mom, Penny, checked her phone at midnight and thought it was odd that Thomas had missed curfew. It was very unusual for him, and if he knew he was going to be late, he always called or texted to let her know he was on the way home. She waited a little bit longer, but woke her husband up around 12.30 a.m. and told him she was going out to look for Thomas. Tucker was still awake, watching a movie with his friend, and was also enlisted to help search. Their initial concern was that Tom had gotten in an accident, and using separate vehicles, they drove around. Thomas's friends were also called. They confirmed they saw Thomas drive off to go home around 11 p.m. and hadn't heard from him since. They had also been surprised that Thomas hadn't made it home yet, his friend said, My first thought was that he had just gotten a flat tire. I mean, nothing ever happens in Canadian. Nothing terrible. So, I mean, I was concerned, but I didn't have a huge amount of concern. After searching for two hours with no sign of Thomas, Penny called the sheriff's department and reported Thomas missing. A deputy joined the search. Tucker went back to the house where he and his friend had been hanging out, but Thomas wasn't there either. There were several volunteer search parties that morning, all to no avail. Everyone was extremely worried because it was very out of character for Thomas not to come home or contact his parents when he knew they would be concerned. One of the volunteers owned a helicopter sales and service company, and he took one of his choppers up in the air to search for Thomas's car. They found it under a small cluster of trees near the town's water treatment plant. There was no sign of Thomas near the vehicle. It was found unlocked and seemingly abandoned. Inside, they found his debit card, his football gear, a costume from a drama production, towels, jumper cables, and the car showed no signs of malfunction. There were, however, several stains that were later determined to be dried blood and a .25 caliber shell casing on the floor of the vehicle. Missing was his wallet, cell phone, keys, and backpack. The news of Thomas's car being discovered postponed many residents' Thanksgiving plans. A huge gathering of volunteers on foot, horseback, and on ATVs were out in full force, searching for Thomas. The man with the helicopter also got his son to fly a second helicopter around, and the two of them stayed low to the ground and searched. A tracking dog was also brought in, but the dogs couldn't pick up Thomas' scent anywhere near the vehicle. By the end of the day, authorities were still fairly certain Thomas hadn't left town. CCTV footage around town was checked, and they determined that the Durango had been captured several times in the early morning hours, driving around town. It was last captured heading towards the water treatment plant at 5.56 a.m., driving slowly along the dirt road, parking, and then turning the headlights off. The headlights had been the only lights in the area, and without car lights, it was impossible to determine if it was even Thomas who was driving. Unfortunately, they did not have much more to go on other than it appeared he had abandoned his vehicle. 
Local police called in help from surrounding counties and sheriff's departments. The FBI was also contacted, but because there was not enough evidence, the case eventually went cold and the search ended. When it became clear that the authorities were not looking for Thomas anymore, his family hired a private investigator to continue the search. The private investigator, who was also a retired state police detective, continued to investigate Thomas's disappearance. Penny said that Tom wasn't a gun person. She had no explanation for the shell casing found in the car. She said that she had checked their guns and they were all accounted for in the lockup. She also said she hadn't noticed any recent changes in personality, nothing that might suggest he was depressed. But she did say he had a lot on his plate that year. He had been having trouble deciding what college he wanted to go to or what he wanted to study, and he had also recently broken up with his girlfriend. Thomas's backpack, which also contained his high school-issued laptop, was discovered two months later in January 2017 by Lake Marvin. Nothing suspicious was found on the laptop, no DNA was recovered, and it appeared to all be in good condition, despite being outside for several weeks. It had also been in an area that had been extensively searched in the days following his disappearance, so it was an odd discovery. Ten months later, in October 2017, his cell phone was found near where his backpack had been recovered, also in pristine condition, despite almost a year outside. In January 2019, over two years after Thomas Brown had disappeared, skeletal remains were discovered near Lake Marvin. Using dental records, they confirmed it was Thomas. The cause of death was never able to be determined, but they were able to say that he had suffered blunt force trauma to the skull. It also called into question how his body and vehicle had been found 14 miles apart from each other. The remains were found in a wooded area, 500 feet or about 1.5 kilometers from the road. If Thomas had committed suicide or had an accident around Lake Marvin, how did his car get to the water treatment plant? The private investigator involved in Thomas's case has reiterated that question several times. He also says that his evidence, which contradicts with law enforcement, shows that there is evidence to suggest Thomas had been attacked from behind and shot in the back of the head. He also said that he had a cadaver dog alert to the back of the vehicle, indicating a deceased person had been in the back of the car. He theorizes that Thomas was murdered in the front seat, pulled to the back, his belongings thrown out of the car on the way to Lake Marvin, where his body was dumped, and then the car was abandoned near the water treatment plant, where the murderer was either picked up by another vehicle or escaped on foot. Which still doesn't answer the question, who wanted Thomas Brown dead? At this time, this case is suspended, meaning it is neither closed nor active. The Office of the Attorney General took over the case in February of 2018, and has stated that until more evidence comes to light, there will likely be no progress on this case, and they are unwilling to categorize it as a homicide at this time. Andrea Bowman In a matter of days, Dennis Lee Bowman is set to be sentenced after pleading guilty to the murder of his adopted daughter, Andrea Alexis Bowman. For 30 years, the missing persons case of Andrea Bowman had gone without leads. The 14-year-old was alleged to have run away back in March 11, 1989, after coming forward with allegations that her adopted father was abusing her. When she was returned back into the care of her adopted parents, she had made the decision to run away. Dennis Lee Bowman already had a criminal past of harassing women, one that should have excluded him from being able to adopt in the first place. In 1980, he had been arrested when a young woman accused him of luring her to a secluded area and attacking her in Michigan. He pleaded guilty and made a deal with prosecutors at the time and didn't serve prison time, perhaps due to his connection of being a naval reservist assigned to the USS Piedmont. In 2019, Parabon Nanolabs connected his DNA to a cold case murder, that of 25-year-old Kathleen Doyle. Kathleen had been assaulted and stabbed to death in 1980. At the time, Bowman was 31 and was in Norfolk, Virginia for a two-week annual active drill. He was arrested for that murder in 2019 in Algon County, Michigan. Upon his arrest, and faced with multiple sources of DNA connecting him to the murder, Bowman confessed. 
Following his confession, the then 71-year-old was charged with burglary, first-degree murder, and rape. In that case, he had been sentenced to two life prison sentences and faced the rest of his life in prison. Also, while he had been awaiting sentencing for the previous murder trial, Bowman again made another confession. He told detectives that he had murdered his 14-year-old adopted daughter in 1989. He claimed that he had come home early and discovered Andrea packing a duffel bag. She also had some cash that had been in the home for emergencies, as well as cash from a tax return that had been waiting to be deposited in the bank. He claimed he had been angered and struck Andrea, causing her to fall backward down a staircase. He said that she broke her neck and he buried her in the backyard. Officers were deployed to where he said he buried her, and only a few days later made this announcement. On March 11th, 1989, the Allegan County Sheriff's Office responded to a runaway complaint in Fillmore Township, Allegan County. The subject reported as a runaway was 14-year-old Andrea Michelle Bowman, who was born on June 23rd, 1974. And after I stood over the spot for a few minutes, I turned and I was going to walk back, and Todd walked me back to the house. And all I can say to him is he didn't lie to me this time. He didn't lie, Todd. Brenda says her husband claimed he and Andrea had an argument about her running away, that he slapped her and she accidentally fell down the stairs. But the medical examiner could not determine Andrea's cause of death because three decades had passed by the time her remains were found. Bowman was bound over today to stand trial on murder charges in Andrea's death. Detectives in Virginia and in Michigan are concerned there may be additional victims out there. Another woman has already come forward, saying Bowman, who had been her co-worker in the 90s, had repeatedly broken into her home. Maybe 15, 20 times he broke into my house. According to these court documents provided to Fox 17 by Andrea Bowman's biological mother, police set up a silent alarm. When it went off one day, a Michigan state trooper found Dennis Bowman, who said he went to the residence to use the restroom. That was a lie, though. Bowman eventually getting convicted for breaking and entering, even admitting that he took several items of lingerie that he found at the house. Discovered when police issued the search warrant, along with a short-barreled shotgun and black mask. And I'm so thankful that I'm still here because I think I was next on his list. Larry Ray Trevathan. This case was sent in by one of the community members, and it is his father. Missing since June 5, 1993, Larry Ray Trevathan was last seen in Lodi, California, which is a town south of Sacramento. He had been expected to attend an event with his son on June 3rd, but didn't show up, which had been extremely out of character for Larry. He was reported missing on June 6th by his estranged wife, his truck was recovered abandoned at the South Shore area of Calaveras County Lake. The area was thoroughly searched, but there was no sign of Larry. Little is known about the circumstances of Larry's disappearance, but his children are still hoping that someone will remember something that will help conclude this cold case. Larry was 49 at the time of his disappearance, 6 foot 5, 180 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. Michael John Olson. Michael John Olson had moved to West Palm Beach, Florida to advance his career. The 20 year old was a passionate golf player and had hopes of working in some capacity in the golf industry. He was a business student at the University of Minnesota and had decided to take a year off to work and maybe get his foot in the door. Michael was described as responsible a super likable guy that was reliable and very sweet. He grew up in Adena, Minnesota, where he had lived his whole life. He had grown up in a loving home, and he was close to his siblings and parents. He called his parents often to update them on his life, and they said he was very excited to start his new job. Shortly after his move, he got a job at the President Country Club. He hadn't secured an apartment yet, so he was staying at the Howard Johnson Hotel near the country club. He loved working at the country club. It gave him the opportunity to golf there when he wasn't working. Florida was the place to be for golf, and working at the country club gave him the best advantages. 
On Friday, November 30th, Michael had the day off. He had spent the morning golfing, and then he went to a local rental agency to find an apartment to rent. At 6 p.m., he met up with some of his co-workers at a dog track that was near his hotel. His friends say that he placed a couple of bets, but no one could say if he had won or lost that night. After the tracks closed, the group went to a nearby bar to watch a boxing match on the TVs, and then bar hopped until around 4 a.m. His friends said that Michael hadn't drunk much and was just hanging out. They said they dropped Michael off at his car, and he said goodnight, and I'll see you at work in the morning, and then he drove off. Michael didn't see them the next morning, as he missed a shift. His friends thought that was extremely unusual and called the motel. He also didn't answer the phone in his room. They called the front desk, who also tried to reach him, but had no luck. After their shifts ended, they drove by the hotel and noticed Michael's car wasn't in the parking lot. He drove a maroon 1979 Pontiac Grand Prix. The following morning, they went back to the hotel and asked the clerk if Michael had checked out. They confirmed he had not, and they tried to call him again. The clerk, concerned that Michael had left without settling his bill, called the police. On Monday, December 3rd, Michael Olson's parents were notified of his disappearance. His case turned into a suspicious disappearance. Police had initially assumed that Michael had just left, but his parents assured officers that he was excited about his job that he was responsible, he kept regular contact with them, and wouldn't have just left without telling anyone. His room was searched and all his possessions were still in the room, indicating that he had intended to return. It also didn't appear that he had ever made it back to his room after he left his friends in the early morning hours of December 1st. This was strange, because where he was dropped off was only about a mile from his hotel. Detective's second theory was that Michael was somehow involved with more serious crimes, but his friends and parents confirmed that they had no reason to think Michael was involved with drugs or had gambled away all his money. His friends had again stated that Michael didn't even drink that much. He was very committed to golfing and his career. There has been no further evidence uncovered in Michael's case. Neither he nor his car has ever been found. Again, in this case, there isn't really a lot of information about it. It doesn't appear to be actively investigated by the West Palm Beach Police Department. Michael's parents passed without ever knowing what happened to their son, but his siblings have continued on to try and keep his cold case active. They are still desperate for answers. Michael was 5 foot 8 and 165 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes. Chandra Cruz On September 5, 2018, in the early morning hours, the Tucson Police Department received a call from 911 about a possible victim of assault, but the line was disconnected before officials could learn who made the call. They arrived at the 1600 block of West Prince Road in Tucson, Arizona, where a woman was discovered with possible stab wounds in the driveway of the apartment complex. The victim, 39-year-old Chandra Cruz, was unresponsive and pronounced deceased at the scene. Officers began a murder investigation. They surveyed the surrounding apartments and discovered that Cruz had been visiting a friend in an apartment across the street when someone said they saw a young man chase her across the road and stabbed her multiple times. Officers quickly identified the attacker as 21-year-old Brian Guzman Hernandez. Hernandez already had a criminal history and it is unclear what had prompted him to attack Cruz. Hernandez is still at large. Authorities still have an active warrant for his arrest on first-degree murder, and he is considered to be armed and dangerous and not to approach. If anyone knows anything about Brian's whereabouts, they are asked to call Crime Stoppers. Dolores De La Pena It has been five decades since Dolores de la Pena was kidnapped and brutally murdered. With many of the suspects now deceased, it may be difficult to get justice, but Philadelphia police are still working to solve this case. It was July 12, 1972 in Kensington, Pennsylvania, 
when 17-year-old Dolores de la Pena was on her way home. She had spent most of the day helping her mother with laundry. Her family had just come back from a 10-day trip from Florida, and it was their first day back. It had been a scorching hot July day, and she had stepped out to get a pack of cigarettes and see a couple of friends in the cool evening, but was expected to return before her midnight curfew. Dolores had just graduated high school with honors. She had plans to go to university in the fall to become an x-ray technician. After the trip to Florida, she had plans to spend the rest of the summer at the Jersey Shore. It was around midnight when Dolores was heading home. She had met up with a couple of friends and said goodbye as she got off her trolley stop. She was walking quickly home and only had a few steps more to get to the house when a car pulled up beside her and dragged her inside. Dolores was never seen again. Her parents noticed her missing right away, but had no idea she had been so close to home when she had been abducted. They called the police, and despite an extensive search, nothing came up about the missing girl. Then, 11 days later on July 22nd, a butcher in New Jersey discovered the torso and dismembered arms of a young woman along a rural road. Apparently dumped, it had been a shocking discovery to the community. A week later, an older man walking his dog discovered a leg seven miles away from where the torso had been, and police were able to find a second leg nearby. Exhaustive searches were undertaken to recover a head, but it was never found. DNA was used to confirm that the body was Dolores. Injuries to her body showed extensive bruising and indicated that she had been tortured. No one could understand why a teenage high schooler had been brutally attacked in such a way. Years later, in the mid-1990s, a witness came forward that may have provided some answers to decades-old questions. He had been 16 at the time, and had claimed to have been there when six men abducted Dolores. He claimed that the men were part of a local biker gang, one that he had also hoped to become a member in, and said the two people had identified Dolores as being the thief of a substantial amount of drugs. He said they kidnapped, tortured, and dismembered Dolores and dumped her body in revenge. Officers have conducted hundreds of interviews and interrogations in connection to Dolores' murder, but have yet to turn up any incriminating evidence. They say that most of the suspects they have are now deceased, but they are still committed to solving her murder officially. Dolores' parents passed before ever knowing what happened to their daughter. In 2020, they dug up a storage unit based on a tip and hoped to uncover new evidence, but the expedition turned up empty. They are still hopeful that new evidence will turn up, or new witnesses will come forward. Well, that is it for this video. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content, and subscribe for more if you haven't already. Also, don't forget to turn on that notification bell so you get notified when I post. If you've done all that and want to support me and the channel, we have channel membership and Patreon to get early access, members-only content, live streams, and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box and links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.